Good evening, and thank you for joining me on this edition of the Wholehearted Christian Mobile Bible Study. And today we are continuing in our Justice According to Jesus series. This episode will be entitled, The Imago Day and Slavery in the Bible. Okay, so this is going to be three sections to this. The first part I'm going to deal with is the Imago Day. The second part I'm going to deal with is slavery in the Bible. And the third part I'm going to deal with is racial reconciliation. So um, let's go ahead and get started. The Imago Day. That is Latin for the image of God. Okay, so my point in this Bible study is to show without a shadow of a doubt, without any debate, without one single question, that all men are created equal in the sight of God. So then if we are in the sight of God, the one who is righteous, the one who is perfect, the one who is holy, the one whose standard that we have to meet, if we all are created equal in his sight, then it doesn't matter what someone else may deem me as inferior. It doesn't matter that someone else may see me as less than. What does God say? God says we are all equal because he created us all equally. Now, first let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Verses 26 through 29. And we'll, we'll set this thing up right here. For you are all, all of us who are believers. And now, mind you, this Bible study is not for unbelievers. This is for believers. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, we can stop it right there and we can shut it off. We are all equal. We are all in salvation, in the sight of God, through the Spirit, as we are saved, as we are born again by the Spirit, as we are adopted into the body of Christ, we are all equal. Now, in the context of the scripture, it's talking about equality between Jew and Gentile, but we can also use it here between black and white. No one is superior. No one is inferior. We are all equal. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Again, there is no black or white. We are all one human race in Christ Jesus. As God created us, so Christ brings us back into righteous standing with God through the death and blood of his cross. There is the racial reconciliation. We are made one through the death of Christ, through the blood and the sacrifice of Christ at the cross. So then we are all one who believe. We who believe are all one. There is no hierarchy of Christians. There is no super Christian. There is no lesser Christian. There is no black Christian. There is no white Christian. There is no superior Christian. There is no inferior Christian. There are only Christians, children of God, equal in the sight of God. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that just makes it clear. That just brings it straight from the scripture. There is no black and white. There is no male or female according to salvation in the scripture, according to the, the, the workings of God. Now, somebody else might look at me and say, that black guy is less than, or I might look at some white person to say that white person is less than, but that is not to be. We as Christians should not think that way. We as Christians should not label anybody or make ourselves to feel or think ourselves better than anybody else because we are all on the same level playing field as any other Christian. 
All right. So I think I made that point well enough. Let us go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, there's another thing on the back of this Black Lives Matter movement that is being pushed on every TV station, pushed all over social media. What's piggybacking on that, which people aren't paying attention to, is the LGBTQ movement that is piggybacking on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. So then now we're not just talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about people where, where the Bible says he created male and female. Two, male and female, not other, not male wanting to be a female, not female wanting to be a male, but male and female. So then we have to be very careful careful because this is a very slippery slope we're going down with the black lives matter movement because adam and eve were the first ones created by god everyone who was born after them comes through their bloodline so we all black white mexican chinese asian african whatever we all have the same exact blood running through us from Adam and Eve. Now, I'm not getting all technical like O positive and B plus and all that stuff or whatever. I'm just saying that we all come from Adam and Eve. All of us, every single person that touched this planet comes from the bloodline of Adam and Eve. So then in the sight of God as they were created both in the image of God then so are we all, man, woman, and child, created in the image of God. Both naturally and spiritually, we are the same. We are on equal playing field. We are on level playing field. We are not lacking anything compared to someone else, and we are not superior compared to someone else. Now, another thing about the image of God, we are created in his image and his likeness, right? All of us. So then, like God, what we share in common with Adam and Eve in being like God is the fact that we are able to think, we are able to rationalize, and we are able to explore our own will and our emotions. Because God has a will, God has emotions, God thinks, God rationalizes, God does all of these things. So that's where we get it from. That is how we are made in the image of God and his likeness. Now, the important thing to remember is that since the fall of man, since Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden, because they were perfect, they were good before, they were sinless before, they were holy before. But once they ate from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they became fallen. And so then, because we are by extension, born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we are also fallen. So then our emotions, unlike God, become fallen and imperfect. Our thoughts, unlike God, become fallen and imperfect. Our will, unlike God, becomes fallen and imperfect. Our uh, emotions and all of these things become fallen and imperfect. So now we are less like God than we would have been had Adam and Eve not ate the fruit. So that's what it means for us to be made in the image and the likeness of God. But we are all equal because none are righteous. We went over that last week. None are righteous. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. No, not one is righteous. So then again, in salvation, in unrighteousness, in humanity, we are all equal and on level playing field. So then that also brings me to what we spoke about for a quick second at the end of last week's Bible study was the three-fifths compromise. Now, when you go back to look at 
human history or, or, or you know, the history of slavery, the three-fifths compromise was that uh, for every five white people, they counted three black people, the three-fifths compromise. And what that was, was it was a compromise that they would count black people as a person anyway, giving them any kind of value. So that way they could get more seats in the delegation for the uh, Congress or whatever. So um, that's a part of history. That is a part of history. We can't deny it. We know that that happened, that that black people were made to seem as less valuable or not as valuable as the white man. But in Christ, as we get saved, as we come to know God. We are on level playing field. It ain't no black and white. It ain't no rich and poor. It ain't no free and slave. It ain't no male and female. And the show ain't no no uh, races and stuff in this stuff. We are children of God, all of us together. All right, moving on. All right, so let's go to slavery in the Bible. Okay, what does the Bible say about slavery? Let's look at, uh, really quickly, turn to Exodus chapter 21. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Now, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve you six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. That already doesn't sound like the slavery that Africans endured after the slave, the transatlantic slave trade. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. And if a, if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters, meaning he will treat her like she is his actual daughter and not like a, a, a servant. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. Okay, so when we look at this, we understand that slavery, according to the Bible, the way that God allowed it in the Old Testament, was a, a business model. This is a way that they, in those times, settled debts. Uh, for instance, if I just to make a, a, a an example, if I drove my Mazda that's paid for, ain't worth two cents, and I got into an accident with a $75,000 Cadillac Escalade, and I didn't have the money to pay for the damages that I did to his car, then he, I would end up working for him as a, as a slave or as what we call in world history class, we called it an indentured servant. I would work off my debt to him. But here in the Bible, it says only for six years. Then once that six years is up on that seventh year, I get to go free. So you see all the different things here. And also as you get further down into the, uh, where it says, if, uh, they sold the daughter that, that that's an arranged marriage. That's an arranged marriage. We know about arranged marriages where the, the, the parents give the daughter away, or in this case, give the daughter to the master and the master could either, either marry that, uh, 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 servant, or he could 
give that servant to his son to, to marry. And so basically it's, it's a business uh, production going on here. And this is how they conducted business. This is how they settled debts. This is how some of the marriages were arranged. Now, quickly, I want to go to uh, Genesis chapter 29. So I want to show you about these arranged marriages. Genesis chapter 29. Uh, look at verse 15 to 18. It says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Again, a business transaction. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's, Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Okay, so this is one of those cases where Jacob became willingly a slave or a servant, indentured servitude of Laban in order to marry his daughter. Now we know how that story went because Laban tricked Jacob and gave him the oldest daughter, Leah, because it wasn't their custom that the younger daughter get married before the older daughter. So he gave him Leah. And Jacob ended up working another seven years to get Rachel. So then he did. He had two wives, Rachel and Leah. And so I just wanted to show you that some of these slaves in the Bible were willing slaves in order to get what they want. It was a business transaction, a business model, a business production. This is how they did it in those days. Now, mind you, even um, before the Exodus, the Jews were slaves. The Israelites were slaves. And their slavery was harsh and abusive by the hands of the Egyptians. Yet the slavery that God talks about in uh, Exodus 21, that is nothing, 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 nothing. It doesn't compare. It's not akin. It's nothing like other than using the word slave. Other than using the word slave, it is nothing close to what our ancestors went through um, over 400 years ago. And, you know, like I think within the last 150 years in this country, what they went through. So um, that is slavery in the Bible. So hopefully this helps you in your mind whenever you hear somebody else, because they do it all the time. Well, the Bible talks about slavery. This is not the same type of slavery. It is not the same thing. And it was only to last six years, no longer. Not the same. They, the, the, the slaves who were brought to America and to many other countries. And matter of fact, I believe it is a fact that Brazil had the most slaves out of every country. Only 400 and some thousand slaves were in America. There were so many more in Brazil out of the, what I believe it was 9 million or so slaves. I don't know. But anyway, um, we understand that we have to defend the word of God. And in order to defend the word of God, in order to defend the faith, we must first understand and read the word of God. So then we know, okay, when somebody talks about slavery in the Bible in a negative connotation, you know, slavery in the Bible ain't nothing like what our ancestors went through. They weren't beat. They weren't raped. They were, if anything happened to them, there was, uh, you look into Leviticus, I believe it was, where you find that God said, if you deal with these people in this kind of way, that there's certain kind of punishments they got for mistreating the slaves or mistreating their servants or whatever. So, so that's slavery in the Bible. So I'm done with that. Now, finally, we want to talk about racial reconciliation. So for this one, I want to go to, let me read Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So then when you hear people saying, hey, y'all need to apologize for what your ancestors did to my ancestors. Y'all need to uh, pay us reparations and all of these things. How can you make somebody who had nothing to do with what happened to your ancestors apologize to you for what their ancestors did? So if my great, 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 great granddaddy was a serial killer, then I should be ashamed and apologize to everybody who's ever been murdered because my great, 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 great granddaddy was a serial killer? Absolutely not. That is foolish and that is not right. Because if we are Christians talking to the church, if we are Christians, if we are talking about being one in Christ, if we are on equal and level playing field in Christ, nobody owes you an apology for something they didn't do. The Bible says, that the sins of the father are no longer passed down to the son. So then I am not responsible for what my ancestors did and neither are white people responsible for what their ancestors did. They weren't here. They didn't do it. I wasn't here. I didn't, I wasn't affected by it in a direct sense. So then I can't look at somebody who had nothing to do with slavery and tell them that they need to bow down to me or to Black Lives Matter, or to any other organization, because you owe me something. Nobody owes anybody anything. We owe everything to Christ. All right, so let us look at um, Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 22. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled and in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and, abru and above reproach in his sight. So then if Jesus Christ has reconciled us to the father, if Jesus Christ has made us right with the father, if Jesus Christ has reconciled all things, fixed all things, took all things to the cross, all of our sins, past, present, and future. If he's taken all of these things to the cross and they were buried with him, but when he came up, they didn't come back up. Then it is over. Racism is is over. If that is in your past, it's over. If you owe somebody an apology, give it to them. If you have been racist towards somebody, if you have been prejudiced towards somebody, if you have racially profiled somebody, apologize. Get it right. Do everything in your power to get it right. But after you have done that, that is it. I don't owe you an apology for my ancestors. White people, you do not owe anyone an apology for your ancestors. Because if you are in Christ, if you have uh, believed in his sacrifice, if you believe that he rose again from the dead, that he is the son of God, then you are saved and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Christ, is, Christ has reconciled all of us together as one and put us in right standing with the Father. So if we are in right standing with God, I don't care what you think. I don't care about your uh, 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 demands of being part of this group or bowing down to this group. I will not bow. And, and, and my friends, you should not bow. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what color your skin is. And we do not bow. We do not owe any apologies to anybody for any sin that we did not commit. The sins of the father are not passed down to the son. So then therefore the soul that sinneth, it shall die. I'm responsible for me. When we see God face to face, when we see Jesus in judgment, we're going to have to answer for ourselves. So I don't owe and I don't expect an apology from anybody who didn't have anything to do with harming me. I don't expect anybody and I don't command or demand and I don't want to hear an apology from anybody who's supposed to be a Christian for something that they had nothing to do with. 
We are all reconciled in the blood of Christ's cross. He did it already. We're reconciled. We're in him. If we are in Christ, we become new creatures. So how can I hold you accountable for something that had nothing to do with you? Christians, we ought to be ashamed. We ought to be ashamed. We ought to get it right. We ought to stop doing what we're doing. We know it's not right in the sight of God. Demanding no uh, uh, uh apologies for stuff that nobody had nothing to do with. They won't hear 150 years ago. They couldn't control what their grandparents, great, great grandparents and whoever else did. That's no, no, that's not right. And y'all know it ain't right. It ain't right. I don't care who said, I said what I said and I stand on the word of God. It is not right. And if we demand these things, if we speak the same language, if we back this movement, if we're in this thing, then we're wrong. We are in fear of judgment. We are in fear of hellfire. We better be very careful because God is the judge. And God ain't holding racism against no, I mean, excuse me. God is not holding slavery against anybody that is living today unless they are still practicing that thing, unless they are still in that mindset, if they are still racist and all of these things. You cannot be a Christian with that because the Bible says we are all one. Nobody superior, nobody inferior. So if you have that mindset, you need to repent. But other than that, anybody who has the mindset that somebody owes them an apology for something that happened when these people weren't even alive, you need to repent.